sort of epitomizes this whole issue. If we don't laugh at it, we're not going to get there. You know, uh, the, um, we've got to put a little mirth in this issue. Otherwise, it is the most depressing thing in the world to look at the numbers that you're about to see. Um, in 1964, CBS this is Begins where the modern era all began. The Surgeon General of the United States on January 11, 1964. It is a judgment of the committee that cigarette smoking contributes substantially to mortality from certain specific diseases and to the overall death rate. That was Surgeon General Dr. Luther Terry, an Alabamian who was commissioned by, good timing for this cough, let's get everybody cough. I mean, let's join in sympathy with all the people dying of smoking diseases, good. Either that or have some water, one of those two, okay. But, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, it breaks people up, I know. I, but the, the, um, the whole notion of what we're doing today 
began, in a way began, 48 years ago. But really, what was the Surgeon General's report? That was not the beginning. That was the end result of 40 years of knowing what smoking did to you. We knew at least 15 years when I mentioned 1950. We knew epidemiologically what smoking was doing to people. But even for 30 years before that, by 1941, Dr. Alton Oxner in New Orleans and Dr. DeBakey, his student at the time, could compile over 400 references in the scientific literature connecting smoking to lung cancer by 1941. We're talking really ancient history. In a way, 48 years ago was only the end point. That was supposed to mark the end of any doubt and the beginning of absolute action. And here we are, 48 years later, we've made good progress. But proportionate to what we could have done, we could have eliminated this plague. The, um, uh, Dr. Terry was appointed by President Kennedy because the Cancer Society and other organizations got together and said, we need to end all doubt on this issue. 150 names were generated, the first 10 that Dr. Terry invited to serve on the panel, none of whom had ever spoken publicly on smoking, all accepted. There was no minority report. All 10 agreed after one year in studying upwards of uh, 10,000 articles that had appeared in the literature, they said this is a slam dunk. Smoking is the leading preventable cause of lung cancer and a probable preventable cause of heart disease and emphysema. The case was closed 48 years ago. And what's happened since then? Verdict was guilty as charged. This was from Life magazine. It didn't even make the cover that week in Life magazine. It did make the front pages of most American newspapers. It was held on a Saturday when the stock market was closed. And it was held in the US State Department. And all the reporters were given a copy of the report. They had three hours to look through it. And then they could leave. The doors were locked. And then they could leave and file their stories. This was a major news event. And we were coming up to the 50th anniversary. So yesterday, I met at the Clinton Library in the hope of convincing the library to create an exhibition for the 50th anniversary of this report. And Clinton was the president that did the most on this particular issue. I don't think it's going to happen. Uh, we've already failed to get a stamp, just a little US postage stamp, commemorating the 50th anniversary of the Surgeon General's report. They have already voted it down at the US Stamp Advisory Committee in spite of endorsements from every major medical organization in the United States. We've been waging a campaign, trying to get people to write. But again, I guess nobody writes letters anymore anyway. So, but the fact of the matter is, we should be looking at this upcoming 50th anniversary as perhaps the end of this epidemic and saying, we're just going to hope that in 50 years from now, people will scratch their heads and wonder what smoking was all about. But that's, that's where we are. I'm not going to give us an A in our report card over the last 50 years. But I hope that uh, we won't even have to have a meeting. Because at the same time the Surgeon General's report was being published, this is what you saw on TV. Winston, America's best-selling, best-tasting filter cigarette. Uh, Winston tastes good. Like a cigarette should. Every Friday night, I would watch the Rin Tin Tin show, and that was the sponsor. Uh, that was the next show, the Flintstones, and that was the sponsor. Um, we've had 12 million people die since the Surgeon General's report who smoked, and we could have had a lot fewer. We really could have done better. Of course, the Kansas Society likes to say that uh, we've had 20 million stop smoking, and I say, yeah, one way or the other. But the fact of the matter is that we really haven't made, in my opinion, as much progress. 40 years, this was a few years ago, we still have the same absolute number of people smoking as we had back then. And uh, you know, the population's gotten bigger, the prevalence has gone down, but we still have the same absolute number. And in Alabama, the smoking rate, as it is elsewhere, has gone up for the first time in 15 years. So Arkansas and Alabama are joined uh, in this um, lower group of around 40, 41st. Alabama's about 44th, uh, 45th. Um, in terms of our smoking prevalence. We may be worse actually now. And, and it's just, it's not good. Um, in, in Arkansas, as you heard Dr. Esslis point to, um, we're above the national average. And it's worse in men. Upwards of 25% in, in uh, adult men are smoking. In Arkansas, your death toll, I, I looked up, uh, is about 4,900 a year. To put that in comparison, and Pinky, you were talking about how People uh, don't want to, uh, they think that one of the candidates for, for uh, governor, was it, that said that uh, automobile deaths are so much greater. The number of automobile deaths uh, uh, in, in this state is now below 1,000. But look at the comparison. 
Again, each of those automobile deaths is reported in the nightly news, as well they should be. But those people dying off in their rooms, uh, dying slowly of tobacco diseases, are not reported. If you look at the top six causes of death, there's only one thing that they all have in common, and that's smoking. In other words, cholesterol is connected to heart disease, but it's not connected to cancer. Stroke, COPD, which is emphysema. Accidents, what is accidents? Well, there's fires. And, uh, you know, this was a fraternity fire in Mississippi. A couple of brothers died in that one. Fraternity brothers died. Um, so we do have a serious problem with fires. This is coronary heart disease. I show the New York Times because on the front cover they're advertising, they're talking about coronary heart disease, on the back cover they're advertising a pack of risk factors. Now this is over 30 years ago. But the New York Times, when did they stop taking cigarette hats? Less than 10 years ago. Now we wrote to them for so many decades to the New York Times saying, please, you've taken out ads for certain kind of movies and for, for guns, but why not cigarettes which are killing people? And they said, well, when Congress bans the ads, we won't take them. That was the lofty New York Times. What is the effect of heart on the heart? Think of this, and this is how you can explain to each and every person who smokes, it's a double whammy. It's that muscle, it's what I call Marlboro's myocardial mayhem. It starves the heart muscle of oxygen. And what is the other effect on the vessels? It's, it's what I call camel's coronary consequences. It causes, the nicotine causes the vessels to constrict and then it actually lays down the fat that, lays, that becomes cholesterol plaque. It's the very essence of laying down the clogging of the arteries. We don't see amputations. Uh, and, uh, we see it, uh, we very seldom see amputations in um, patients who did not smoke. Even among diabetic patients, those who lose their legs by and large have also smoked. So it's a crucial thing to understand that peripheral vascular disease is perhaps even more important, more striking certainly, than coronary heart disease. This is, of course, a chest x-ray. The big thing on the left there is a cancer that shouldn't be there. That whole kind of uh, pear-shaped thing that's, or lemon-shaped thing that's coming out of the left side. And yet, if you see that little dot up in the right, that's actually just an artifact, and yet that would be too late. The time you see a, a lung cancer on an x-ray, it is too late. The five-year survival is no better than it was 30 years ago. I used to say that's the good lung on the left and the bad lung on the right until somebody pointed out. Well, it's not exactly still in the person, so you can't say that that's a good lung anymore either, but um, that would be what we would call a normal lung on the left and, and the, the cancerous lung on the right with also some black staining. And, and that didn't have to be in a, in a big smoky city. The lung cancer rate in New York City is the same as in rural Iowa. And the one thing that they both have in common is smoking. That's a thoracotomy score. That's a lucky man. He survived that operation and that lung removal. And this complicated slide is, is cancer deaths. The top of it on the men's side, lung cancer. 31% of cancer deaths among men are due to lung cancer. The next leading one among men, colon cancer, is 10%. It's three times the level of lung cancer versus colon cancer. Among women, lung cancer takes nearly twice the toll of breast cancer. So it's, it's an enormous problem in both men and women. And now the sad thing is, as lung cancer rates decline among men, you see those curves on the far right of the graph, just about all of them are going down, especially lung cancer, because men are stopping smoking. But among women, that curve, we don't know how it's going. It looks like it's going down, but it could go back up. Because women, as Joe Califano, the Secretary of Health once said, want to die just like men. What's the number one brand among women? See, that's the common answer, the Virginia Sims. No, no, never has been, never will be. The number one brand among women is the same among men. It's Marlboro Reds or Marlboro Lights. And that's the thing we've got to get, start talking about those brand names. I think the MSA, again, we could debate this, we wouldn't be here if it weren't for it, but on the other hand, there are restrictions, what you can say and what you can't say. See if I can say some things that you can't say today. But what we should be talking about are brand names. Because the number one preventable cause of death, in my opinion, in the United States is not smoking, it's not nicotine, it's not lung cancer. The number one preventable cause of death and disease in the United States today is Marlboro Lights. And I think that's the words that we've got, those are the vocabulary. I ask my patients, I don't say, do you smoke? How much do you smoke? And again, with all due respect to the quit lines, I'm good because we're going to debate you on that. Uh, with all due respect to that and giving people drugs to stop smoking, the most important thing is the relationship 
that they have with people. And so the best paper I've read in the last couple of years is Christakis's work in the New England Journal of Medicine that found that what we now call social networking, he studied the Framingham Heart data for 40 years. And he discovered that the single most important thing about who stopped smoking and stayed stopped were people who hung out with people who stopped smoking and stayed stopped. It's that beautiful ne networking of like-minded people. Of, of So the most important question I ask my patients now is, who among your family and friends has stopped smoking and stayed stopped? It's the first question I ask. And they think, and they always can think of somebody. I said, get to know that person a little bit better. That's their role model. You've got to do this with other people. It is no longer an individualistic thing. You've got to work with others. And I, I'm doing more, more and more getting people together and stopping and reinforcing each other. And that's, I think it's good. It's a community kind of thing. It does take a village. And I think it's important to take a look at not just giving people a drug. I've been a reviewer for the clinical guidelines, and I do not support giving a drug to everyone who wants to stop smoking. Because then when that fails, what, what do you have next? I, I reserve that drug for people who are having problems. I like to see what they can do on their own. I love behavioral tips. I've learned so many from patients. Um, I love oral substitutes. I love asking, when's the first cigarette you light up in the morning? And when do you, do you smoke in your car? I like to avoid those situations. I can postpone cigarettes. I can give people suggestions for oral substitutes. What do you like best? Mint, cinnamon, lemon drops, kissing? You know, I like to throw these things out, get people to laugh a little bit. Only smoke two hits on the cigarette and put it out to emphasize how expensive it is. I'd rather have people smoke in a pack and a half a day, two hits per cigarette, than, than, uh, than, uh, ten, cig than ten cigarettes, which was all the way down. That's 100 hits versus a uh, pack and a half is 30 times two is 60. I count the inhalations, I count the money, I get them any which way that I think they will appreciate that this is not just a matter of addiction and hopelessness. It's fun to stop smoking too. We don't have to make it harder than it is. We don't have to say it's a more addictive thing than cocaine. What does that mean? That only means, oh my God, I can't do it. And I'm gonna make it a lot less difficult for people to stop smoking. And if they keep on smoking, I'll still be their doctor, but I think we can. Let's do it. I think you can do it. Can I interrupt? Please, sure. For Sorry, excuse me. I hate to interrupt, but we have some people that need to move their vehicles right now. Uh, we have a red burgundy Jeep Cherokee, license plate number 172 KDG, a green Expedition, license plate 876 PMP, a black Corolla, license plate 842 OYO, a blue Corolla, license plate 256 OWK, a green Grand Marquis 597 OMZ, uh, Champagne Camry, 287 POR, a gray Malibu, 295 NAN, a silver Altima, 600 MGD. You're, you're actually blocking the fire lane, so you need to move your vehicle immediately. Like now. Or <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be towed. So. Okay. I'm going to check that Impala here. Let's see. Yeah. <laughs> Did you say, if there's, an, if there's an Impala that's still, that's my rental car. So, okay. In any event, thank you. Uh, sorry about Good that. Good one. Yeah. So I'll get a ride from you then if it doesn't work. Okay. <laughs> but uh, I, I just think it's important to take a look at what we can do, not what we can't do. So I've opposed the, the, the clinical guidelines because I don't think a drug should be offered right out of the gate to everybody. I do feel that, uh, well, people talk about the patch. Isn't the patch good? I said, well, sure, I've got my own patch. I call it uh, the placebo patch. I take a Band-Aid out of the Band-Aid drawer. I put it right there, and I, I take a magic marker, and I write, don't smoke, dummy. And I say, look at that 50 times a day. <laughs> you know, you've heard of Nicorette and Nicoderm and Nicotrol. I've got a new product coming. It's called Nicopositories. But, you know, I, I think we ought, But the whole point is, let's not just put all of our heart and soul into drug companies. Right? This is my who have never lifted a finger prior to them getting a drug to help us. And I went through for 10 years trying to get the pharmaceutical industry interested in helping us fight smoking, not a chance. So I have a little bit of a, of a chip on my shoulder about all the wonderful folks offering Chantix, because I don't think it's a miracle drug. I think it gives a lot of people a lot of problems, but I don't tell patients that it's not a good drug. I can't do that to them. If their heart's set on it, I'll let them go for it. But I don't think it's important to ha I think it's important to have people not believing that it's the drug that's doing it. If that were true, then that's what we would do. We'd give everybody a drug. But that's not what works, because somehow people who use drugs or not use drugs, a lot of them still keep smoking. Those rates are not 50%. Those rates are, at best, 40%. That's with all the emphasis on counseling. 
if you look at the control group of the Chantix interventions, the control group did better than 90% of other trials because there's such heavy talking to and working with people and counseling. And I'm a big believer in behavioral counseling. Um, women are catching up. That graph is only to show that lung cancer among women is actually catching up to that of men. Um, and this is emphysema. You could drive a, a, your, your hand through some of those holes. That's just a terrible situation to have. The only enjoyment of emphysema I've ever heard was from one grandfather who said he liked going to his grandson's pool parties. And I had to think about it. And I didn't, he said, because they would bob for grandpa, because I couldn't sink, he said. And they'd put me down, and I'd bob right back up, and they loved that. Now, and that's a kind of a sense of humor. But <laughs> what emphysema is, it's like holding your breath underwater and then bobbing up to the surface and somebody pushing you right back down. It's horrible. It's 24 hours a day spent on breathing. Now, you've seen emphysema. You've seen, you've almost been run over by them in the little scooters in Walmart, you know, because you didn't see them until they had the damn little scooters. They were off dying in there, and now they run over you, you know. I mean, more power to them, but it's not reducing emphysema. Um, it's now in 5% of the population. It's, it's just an absolutely horrible situation. It's become the fourth leading cause of death, and it is the leading cause of disability payments. If you have diabetes, it's three times the risk of heart disease right out of the gate. But if you smoke and have diabetes, it's 11-fold. There's your major risk factor. It's a microvascular, small vessels. Look at all these other things. We could be listing them all day long. All the other effects of smoking. It just goes on and on. But this changed the whole thing. This is really why we're here. Because this was when the smoke of your cigarette or my cigarette affected the other person. That's when the whole game changed. That's when we had the first clean and air legislation. When Hirayama in Japan and Tricopolis in Greece both discovered why those people, usually women, who got lung cancer, who'd never smoked a day in their life, got lung cancer, then we realized the exposure to spouses and coworkers who smoked was what did it. And that changed everything. Um, 3,000 deaths a year just from passive smoking out of the 190,000 deaths overall from lung cancer. 40,000 heart disease deaths from secondhand smoke, which is now the second leading cancer cause in the United States after firsthand smoke. Children have been taken away from families in the state of Washington by showing up again and again and again with asthma in the, op in the emergency room. It's terrible. I don't approve of taking away children like that. But they're tired of dealing with these recurrent asthma patients. And it doesn't help to say, oh, I go outside to smoke. That's the kind of silly thing that we've got to overcome. This is the million dollar babies. I don't want to guilt trip a parent. I never would. But we've got to do better in pregnancy than we have and before pregnancy. Um, all of these terms are, are related to pregnancy and smoking. I don't want to guilt trip a woman who's had a child dying from sudden infant death syndrome, but we've now made that connection with smoking. Um, pneumonia, uh, school performance up until sixth grade, up in, uh, I think up until six years of age, has been affected by smoking, by parental smoking. You know, 60 years ago, this was an adgy, mommy, you sure enjoy your Marlboros. Marlboro was a woman's cigarette, mild as may, red tips to match your pretty lips, until the Korean War came about. And the men got home, and they were greeted heroically. Uh, not, not greeted heroically, as they had been after World War II. So the advertising agency put a tattoo on their hand. And they made it a macho brand, literally overnight. And this is what I grew up watching. Marlboro Country. Come to where the flavor is. Famous Marlboro Red or new Marlboro 100s, the Longhorns. Come to Marlboro Country. People who still hear that music today think of that. It's just amazing. The greatest advertisements in history. And I grew up with that night in and night out. And then, of course, the ads were banned, a subject of an entire lecture of why cigarette advertising was banned. Why was it banned? It was banned because the tobacco companies wanted to get off of television. Now, why would they get off of television? They wanted to get off of television because of one human being, one lawyer, who in 19, uh, 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 well, right after the Surgeon General's report came out, started looking at all the commercials on TV and saying, where's the anti-smoking commercials? There should be an application of the Fairness Doctrine. And he filed a lawsuit with the Federal Communications Commission and he went on a trip and he came back, gets an envelope, says, yes, we agree with you. 
And that's why anti-smoking commercials went on the air because of one human being. And the industry could not take the competition. Now, even though those ads were on at 3 o'clock in the morning, and of course the TV companies who didn't want the cigarette ads to go away were claiming that they put those counter ads on um, to get the kids when they woke up at 3 in the morning on their way to school. <laughs> so even though they were shown in off hours and in a much smaller percentage, they had an impact. And there were some famous ones, again, the subject of an entirely different lecture. But then the ads were banned in 1971, and uh, no longer did you see the Marlboro country night in and night out. This is what you saw instead. They discovered sports. So in almost every Major League Ball stadium, and this is off my television screen, can you read the warning label on the scoreboard in center field? I mean, that's literally what happened. They never did go off the air, and now they were advertising cheaper than ever before because they didn't have to buy the whole program. They would just take out a billboard that was on key camera angles. Meanwhile, what were we doing in the health community? And you can look this up. You can go back to the American Journal of Public Health or the Journal of the American Medical Association, and you won't find very much on smoking, or at least what we were doing about it. What we were doing about it was saying, oh, that's peer pressure, or that's parents, or the parents. Well, yeah, but nobody, but nobody was looking at propaganda because we were too scared to take on the tobacco industry. Now, uh, was this peer pressure? Of course not. We remember this because this is less than 10 years ago, Joe Camel. And this is a 10-story building in Times Square, New York, walking across the street. I mean, it's just an enormous impact every day. I went to the opposite corner, uh, and I'm up there about eight stories high. I don't like heights. I'm on this little two-foot scaffolding there. I'm staring down and about to fall off because I don't like this. And I just wanted to show you that I didn't even come up halfway to the O. And that was seen by a million pedestrians every day. That's the kind of impact that this cigarette advertising had. Here's a young lady I saw in London. I asked her if I could take her picture. She wondered why I asked her to turn around. But this is called youth marketing. Get them while they're young. And this was Sean Marcy, who used spitting tobacco in Oklahoma as a track star for seven years. He used Copenhagen, and he developed at age 19 an oral cancer. This was a, a, the kind of oral cancer uh, that Morrissey had. And uh, the only solution for this kind of cancer is to cut off half the face, and he wouldn't do that. He died at age 19 from oral cancer. And when I show this in schools, the kids would much rather look at the Skoll race car. And this is from the largest medical center in the world. This is the Texas Medical Center, where they were lined up to get their samples of Skoll less than 10 years ago on the campus of Rice University. I'm so pleased to see a number of campuses uh, going tobacco free. Uh, that's still not the case at the University of Alabama, which I'm hoping. This was after the A-Day game. Uh, uh, 92,000 people coming out of that stadium three years ago and seeing the Skoll uh, tent. I do my research and I signed up and this is the latest. This is of course Snus. Uh, looks like another part of the body that we can't mention because I think the important aspect of what Snus is, it's a very, very deeply disturbing product to me because it's something we all could be doing now and no one would notice because it's no longer a spittable tobacco product. You can actually swallow this stuff. And now a lot of the athletes who were told they couldn't use this are now using snooze products. Um, truly a tragedy. I just wanted to mention this because I think the tragedy of this is we have a number of people in the health community who are recommending this product as a harm reduction strategy. Now if you look at who gets oral cancer, vast majority of people who get cancer of the mouth are people who smoke cigarettes. There's no denying that. So Dr. Radu in, in Birmingham about 15 years ago came up with a theory that as long as we can't get people to stop smoking we, and, and who are addicted to nicotine, maybe we could get them to use a safer nicotine, sort of like a safer form of arsenic. But that was the theory. And this is what was picked up on by the tobacco companies. So today, they're pretending to be, and I say the word pretending, to be part of the solution rather than the problem. So Philip Morris, which makes Marlboro, now has Marlboro snus. In my opinion, that's promoting dual use. So when they can't smoke in a crowded restaurant, they can go out, they can use the snus, and then they can go right outside and smoke back outside. So they maintain a constant level of nicotine. That's my theory. That's my opinion. I stick by it. But we have some very uh, vituperative, very, I think, very argumentative people who are saying that we're uh, the quit or die people. We either want people to stop smoking tobacco or die. And I don't think that's a fair accusation. I think tobacco is a scourge. I think in whatever form it's a scourge. No one is denying that spitting tobacco is less 
harmful in the sense it doesn't cause lung cancer, but it doesn't mean that you want to substitute a safer level of poison for poison. They even give you an instruction booklet how to use this product. It's, it's absolutely sad that this is what has replaced. And notice they still use the cigarette imagery, frost the fire, this kind of heat. Uh, and of course, the warning label now is much bigger. Everybody's into warning labels. I am not into warning labels. You know, this FDA, I mean, I, in fairness, I, I oppose the FDA regulation of tobacco. May you get what you wish for. What do we have now? We have a group that's been meeting for over two years, and they have, they've, they've removed the word lights from cigarettes, so now you have Marlboro Silver and Marlboro Gold and Marlboro Blue. So they haven't done anything other than to ban certain words. They've banned candy flavorings. Well, they haven't banned the flavorings. They've banned the words, cherry and lemon. They have not banned the flavorings. So you have a wonderful Potemkin village called the FDA, which has spent, which has given over $250 million to ban a couple of words so far. And now they're on the spot, because now they've got to figure out what to do about menthol, which could have been banned by Congress under the legislation, but which to appease Philip Morris and the wonderful campaign for tobacco-free kids and Philip Morris were the people that crafted that bill, by the way. Keep in mind that Philip Morris had a hand in that bill, and the campaign would not acknowledge that until very late, and they gave them menthol. They said, okay, okay, we won't ban menthol, because they wanted a bill so bad they could taste it. And I think that was wrong. Better to have no bill than a bill that didn't ban the leading additive, which is now probably not going to get banned for a many, very long time because it's going to be tied up in court so long. Let's go over that product, menthol. How did it get started? Uh, it got started as an accident where a fellow who's grown, who, who had grown up uh, with asthma and his mother gave him menthol, like mentholatum, uh, Vicks vapor rub and that kind of thing. Somehow they had a little can of menthol, and somebody had put the cigarettes in it. And when he opened it to smoke a cigarette, it got so imbued with that menthol, he thought it was great. And he figured out a way to patent a process to spray menthol into the cigarette as it's manufactured so people would think it's cooler. And look at the imagery. This goes back to the 1920s when menthol was invented. And the first brand was called Spud. That was his nickname, the fellow that invented mentholated cigarettes, that cooling uh, snow kind of air, and they called it mouth happiness. They even instructed you, just like that snooze thing did, and how to enjoy that cigarette, and how to savor that menthol. And then they even had the image of the doctor, Dr. Cool, tell him to switch to Cools, because this became, by the 1930s, the leading menthol brand. Um, and they, during, pre this is, goes now into the 1960s. Um, comic strips, the use of comic strips and the Sunday funnies to sell menthol cigarettes. And uh, this one, on television. So soft, so fragrant is the new grass underfoot, the breeze that plays with the blossoms overhead. You're refreshed as only springtime can refresh you or the smoke of a Salem cigarette. For Salem refreshes your taste just as springtime refreshes you. Special high porosity paper, air softens every puff. Invisible porous openings breathe in fresh air to make Salem taste even fresher and cooler, more flavorful, too. Salem is America's fastest growing cigarette by far because it not only refreshes your taste, but gives you rich tobacco taste as well. And high porosity paper, air softens every puff. Menthol fresh, rich tobacco taste. Modern filter, too, that's Salem. More delightfully than ever, Salem refreshes your taste. Isn't that amazing? So by the 1950s, this is what you were seeing on television, and Salem had taken over from uh, all the other menthol brands. And then the real pernicious part began. That's when the targeting of African Americans really took hold. So Ebony and Jet were willful partners in this kind of uh, deliberate targeting. Athletes were used. I hate to say it, but uh, Jackie Robinson, Hank Aaron, uh, almost every great uh, baseball player was part of a menthol cigarette campaign. This is my a part of my training. This was my neighborhood. Um, everywhere you looked, uh, menthol uh, advertisements were posted. Even just outside of people's homes, you could see the Newport billboard. Um, they didn't come into the suburbs, but they certainly came in to what was called the inner city. Um, and uh, this was a graph, you don't have to look at the numbers, but I can tell you where tobacco, um, the, the actual headquarters was located in Arkansas. This was the National Outdoor 
eight sheet advertising company. And I spoke to the guy and he sent me this and it shows you how in black versus Hispanic versus they called it general areas, uh, the difference of how much tobacco advertising. Fully 25% of all billboard advertising in African American areas was tobacco. It was like three times higher than the next leading product advertised. It was a major tragedy. This is your typical scene in Houston, Texas, where I lived for many years, where literally it becomes the actual store name. Um, it's as big as the actual name of the store. Just We would take parents in school districts through these communities and we would show them this, uh, freaking out all the Vietnamese people that own these stores, by the way. We'd, we'd go in with 40 parents into the store to, to give them a glance at where the kids were going after school and, and the shame of these convenience stores. Um, the bus stops. Uh, the buses themselves. Um, and then you look at the magazines that still today, like Essence, still today accept tobacco advertising. Um, it's just astounding. And this one in particular, we have uh, Miss America uh, being used in an advertisement to sell women. Uh, it's just a kind of conjures up all sorts of horrible overtones, but the cigarette advertisement is the, the, the mechanism that gets these. Now, Gloria Steinem did berate me once when I challenged Ms. Magazine for their cigarette advertising. Here's Women's Liberation advertising cigarettes, and she said, what, would you rather us not publish? Because we couldn't publish without the cigarette companies. That was her answer. Disgraceful. But this gives you an idea of the reach of these magazines. Fully 47% of African American women uh, see ebony, and 38% of men. So it goes just, the, it's, a, it's, a, it's certainly something that the Johnson publication people were let, let, let us down. Now, they say, of course, what about the, the non-African American, but why don't you go after, of course we were going after everyone, like the New York Times. But we were just showing you the targeting. And these are brands that uh, over the years have been specifically targeted at, at either Latino or, or African American populations. In 1985, when the AMA, American Medical Association wanted to ban tobacco advertising. Immediately, Philip Morris convened a meeting of 96 black publishers in New York City. They wined and dined, and then they produced a resolution condemning the AMA for wanting to ban tobacco advertising. And uh, let me just show you what CBS News was reporting at that time. Blacks suffer the highest rates of coronary heart disease and lung cancer of any group of Americans. These are diseases that are clearly linked to cigarette smoking. And the National Center for Health Statistics shows that a greater percentage of blacks smoke than any other group of Americans. Critics say that's no coincidence because tobacco companies spend millions of dollars trying to get blacks to smoke. My brother did it. You know, I thought he was cool and I wanted to be cool, so I, I smoked cigarettes. I am afraid of it, but I'm so addicted that it's hard to stop. For American blacks, not smoking isn't just a matter of choice these days. It's a question of life and death. I think it's a serious, much more serious problem than most of the black people realize. Uh, early, you know, unless you're in a field like I am where we sign death certificates, uh, uh, we don't really know how many people are dying. While black physicians view the smoking issue with growing alarm, critics charge that the tobacco companies view black smokers as a growing source of income. In fact, they say, blacks are the target of carefully plotted and highly specific marketing campaigns. They're particularly honing in on people with the lowest disposable income who are taught that smoking is something that is glamorous and wealthy. And the important thing, too, is there are many streets in black areas where virtually all of the retail outlets have cigarette advertising. It's an enormous, heavy concentration. Critics also point out that in many low-income areas, more than half of the billboards carry tobacco ads. Offers of free cigarettes and cheaper generic brands are an added twist. Mass transit systems used by lower income commuters are another popular showcase for black oriented ads. The tobacco industry denies vehemently that they target black groups or any other group. It just isn't true. We advertise nationally to everybody. But the charge is made that these days the industry goes beyond buying advertising to buying influence. At entertainment, cultural, and sports events across the country, good times mingle with the cigarette message in the form of banners, hats, and free samples. Hey, enjoy the sales, enjoy the sales. And that's not all. The cigarette companies are very fond of portraying themselves as the leading corporate benefactors to such organizations as the United Negro College Fund or the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. Our concern with the black community goes, predates any question of the uh, issue of 
smoking in health or attempt to use it. And to say that this is something new is crazy. We fund a wide range of organizations, from the Boy Scouts to the YMCA's to art museums to hospitals. But the critics maintain that because black groups are so dependent on tobacco company funding, black publications and leaders tend not to speak out about smoking's impact on their community. Again, the industry cries foul. You get zealots, I will even call them nuts, who engage in a kind of McCarthyism based on statistics which are unreliable, which are contradictory. They know it's going to kill these people and they're willing to uh, peddle cigarettes in any way that will be successful for them to get richer. So the controversy continues, but down in Durham, North Carolina, in the heart of tobacco country, the nation's largest black insurance company is taking action. They've started a stop smoking project sponsored by the National Cancer Institute. About 40% of the black people are less informed, are depressed economically and socially, and I think more of them are smoking. The goal is to help people like Mary Ann Johnson, who finally quit a lifelong habit four weeks ago. I just decided to change a lot of things in my life that I was doing that I uh, could correct at this point to live a little longer, hopefully. Unfortunately, it's a little late for George Nunn, who smoked three packs a day for 62 years. Cigarette made you cough so bad. Every time I, 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 I couldn't hold a cigarette in my mouth, I'd have to take a draw and take it out. I cough so bad. <laughs> he has lung cancer and emphysema. On a more hopeful note, Against heavy ads and big budgets, some black education does seem to be working. This teenage rap group composed an anti-smoking song for a school assembly. Smoking cigarettes, but you just catch a camp of got lungs like a tire. These youngsters sum up the message that groups like North Carolina Mutual hope will offset the powerful voice of the tobacco industry. They think they're cool by smoking, right? But as you smoke, you know, your lungs and all this gets weaker and weaker, and soon they'll be laying up in the hospital somewhere. And, well, you can't be cool in the hospital. The tobacco industry continues to believe that the results of scientific investigations to date demonstrate no cause and effect relationship between smoking and chronic diseases. Nonetheless, later this month, Congressman Waxman's open, or committee will open hearings on a proposal to ban all cigarette advertising. I show that uh, because that's 25 years old. Now, there's a lot that's changed, fortunately. But if we look at the epidemiology, you know, we still have the, the, the high levels of heart disease. Again, you don't see news stories. That, went on the, that was on the nightly CBS News. It's amazing uh, how you don't see stories that length. Anymore. We, or the average news story is 11 seconds. So I, I think it's important to understand that they did, at least in that era, devote some time to this. And uh, this is where the tobacco industry was. They, they showed, because they were polluting the communities, they would also have to sponsor the public service ads. So they would show how visibly committed they were to the community. And they would give uh, awards, lots of awards. Uh, R.J. Reynolds Tobacco promoted all sorts of cultural and history uh, events. Literacy has been a big uh, feature of uh, uh, these companies. Um, Martin Luther King Day, that ad for R.J. Reynolds. Imagine every year taking out an ad honoring Martin Luther King from R.J. Reynolds Tobacco Company. And Philip Morris would do the same thing, quoting King, saying, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Black is white, white is black. You could take any words and just put a tobacco company logo on it, basically is what they're saying. Uh, even critic Scott King was used uh, by this uh, industry. This is the Philip Morris family of companies to talk about, he sees the things we wished we'd seen. It's just astounding. Uh, black journalists were, were, were co-opted, in my opinion, by Philip Morris's Miller Brewing Company subsidiary. They were the sponsors of the annual meeting of black journalists. This was Ann Browder, uh, the Tobacco Institute spokesperson um, you know, on TV. This was their black organization's guide uh, to Philip Morris. They speak your language. Arts, culture, it was amazing. And I've got all this in my archive. It's something we hardly imagined, but this was going on. This was a Sunday gospel group uh, sponsored uh, by uh, Benson and Hedges. Um, this was the George R. Brown Convention Center where the National NAACP Convention met. And I'm going to play part of what Benjamin Hooks said at that meeting. This was one company, two companies, three companies, um, Four, I mean, this, is, uh, this was another event. I'm, I'm merging two different events at the George R. Brown Convention Center. They were always at the Black Expos, 
Um, and this is Hooks there in a Salem cigarette ad. And this is the Philip Morris companies. And this is what uh, Dr. Hooks was saying. I won't play the whole thing, but. I'm pleased to acknowledge tonight that one of our greatest contributors across the years have been the Philip Morris companies. The Philip Morris companies today sponsor this dinner. Philip Morris, that's like him a great big man. Philip Morris is a wrong This tape was friend. sent to me by a, by a friend who was at that meeting. And a supporter of, of equal opportunity. They did not just come to the table lately. We can remember when Philip Morris was a target of white supremacist boycotts because back in the 1950s they insisted on having an integrated workforce and because of their support for black organizations. We remember when Philip Morris was a pioneer in hiring blacks for non-traditional jobs in industry. Today, we know that Philip Morris is a leader in corporate support for community organizations, minority business and vending programs, and affirmative action. Philip Morris has been regularly cited by Black Enterprise magazine as one of the country's best places for black people to work. Philip Morris is a major supporter of Black College, a company that cares and I want to tell you something, we're happy that they're sponsoring this dinner tonight. This means that we can use the money to increase and enhance our programmatic departments. It's appropriate also because the Spinning Young Medal honors achievers who are models for our youth. And Philip Morris is a high achieving company that is a model for corporate social responsibility. It's just astounding. It just I want to say two things that are not on this clip. But some reporter asked me, were black leaders afraid to speak out because tobacco and alcohol companies give us some money? And without any disrespect to anybody here, I said, why don't you go and ask the publisher of the New York Times? Why don't you ask the publisher of Time Magazine, Newsweek, Businessweek? Why is it that when black folk get a dime, somebody thinks we're selling out, and white folk get a million dollars, and nobody ever asks them, are they selling out? That's a damn racist question, and I want you to know, members of the press, I consider it so. I'm not for sale to anybody. Jesse Jackson not for sale. John Jacob, Andrew Young, all the rest of the black leaders. Carrera Scott, we're not for sale. But if the tobacco companies want to give us some money to help us move black people forward in the name of God, give it, and we're going to tell it and accept it and receive it and use it to build a stronger, stronger America. I want that clearly understood. And anybody that asks that question, you tell them they're racist. Well, I mean, it goes on and on and on. I mean, he, he, he's just getting wound up there. But, but I mean, it's, it's, it's um, fortunately, I ran into somebody at, a, at an expo from Campbell Soup. And we got talking, because I was there to take pictures of, of the Benson and Hedges and so forth. And um, he was wonderful. He said, I, I said, you don't look happy. He says, you wouldn't be happy either if you were sitting there next to a cigarette booth. I said, well, that's why I'm here. And we started talking, we shared cards, and then uh, about a year later, Campbell Soup sponsored one of the very first conferences on health in the African-American population in Atlanta, Georgia, and it was wonderful. So I think that was a company with real responsibility, and he was just sitting there steaming, and I, being his booth was right next to the Philip Morris booth. So there, again, this was a company that nobody criticized, nobody wanted to speak out against. And uh, I could tell you stories that make your hair stand on end about what they were doing. This is just a typical uh, year. I went to, uh, in one calendar year, I went to 41 tobacco sponsored events in the city of Houston, such as Club Benson and Hedges, Benson and Hedges Blues. Um, this was in New York City, the, another Benson and Hedges Blues. Uh, then you had the Cool Jazz Festival. 
the whole romanticism of the, the cool, um, the big, big thing. And then I went to the Ebony Fashion Fair sponsored by More Cigarettes, which is R.J. Reynolds. Um, this was actually a shot from that uh, particular. With today's great American smoke out, Bowen also recommended that all states ban the sale of tobacco to anyone under 18. The cigarette industry's own code forbids promotion aimed at people under 21. But one group targeted by cigarette manufacturers is the black community. And CBS News correspondent Bob Fall has a report on that. Black Americans are smoking more than white Americans, and they're getting sicker from heart disease and lung cancer. Lung cancer is now 50% higher among black men compared to white men. Cigarette smoking is causing an awful lot of deaths in the black community. But in the inner city, the message to light up is overwhelming. The tobacco companies know a market when they see it. You can't get away from it. It's all around us. No, it's not good for the community to have that many billboards around like that because that's enticed the kids to smoke cigarettes. This is the way to stop the traffic on any city street. The tobacco industry has also carefully cultivated the black market by sponsoring events like this, which associate smoking with glamour, and by contributing to black charities. Gee, I am so grateful for this. With its gift of $1 million to the United Negro College Fund, R.J. Reynolds is the fund's biggest donor. You wouldn't consider the tobacco industry money tainted in any way? It, it comes to us green. And that's all that counts? That's the important thing for the United Negro College Fund. I'm not going to pass judgment on the tobacco industry. The, the tobacco industry has bought off the silence of black organizations. And in black publications where roughly 20% of advertisements urge readers to smoke, tobacco industry money can mean the difference between staying in business or going under. They're not going to tell the cigarette companies, we're not going to take your advertising because they have too much to lose. So black publications tend not to run anti-smoking articles. WBLS. That means Ebony has never published an anti-smoking article. Never. Companies might do shy away from anti-smoking commercials. I would be concerned as to whether or not they may ruffle some feathers uh, within Philip Morris. They may decide to spend their advertising dollars on another radio station. If a person is receiving a large amount of money, uh, they will not bite the hand that is feeding them. For example, when we asked the NAACP to discuss the money it gets from the tobacco industry, the NAACP refused. We asked Essence Magazine. The magazine also said no. The topic, said one of its officials, is just too sensitive. Well, this, this is just another example, but the point is, this is the error, and now we're trying to make up for lost time. Uh, this is Miss Black Metroplex uh, in Houston. This was sponsored by Salem Cigarettes. I saw her at another event. They would go to neighborhoods, and look what she's standing in front of. Um, she's standing in front of a Salem video van that uh, would play, uh, it was a kind of a video boombox, and uh, as they sampled, and people would gather around, this is what they would do. So here is another event. Excuse me, sir. Can I ask you not to, to videotape and sampling? Oh, well, why is that? Because we don't, we don't allow it. You don't allow it? Why not? We just, we can't. Because of our sampling rules, we can't allow them to videotape. You can't allow it. Well, I mean, she wouldn't let me photograph their sampling to kids. And this was another event in the Houston uh, main part of town, behind City Hall. They called it a little uh, kind of a game. This is a nightclub. Uh, another nightclub, another nightclub, the year's Eve Bash. I went to all of these events. Again, another billboard. And uh, everywhere you looked, every kind of store. So I went to um, to Lloyd uh, Parker, uh, who was, by the way, Lewis Sullivan, our Secretary of Health at that time, was beginning to speak out and, and uh, was really quite a hero. Deloitte Parker was offered a Cool Achiever Award in Houston for the work that he was doing, and he turned it down. This was a $10,000 award so he could be depicted among those people. It's very clear to us that the black community in particular has been targeted to uh, promote uh, tobacco, cigarettes, and I doubt that you can find any business in this community that does not sell cigarettes. They will sell individual cigarettes for a dime, a, a nickel, to people who cannot buy a whole pack. They sell cigarettes to children in our communities. We have some liberation colors, red, black, and green, that we use in our movement, we've used for years. I noticed very interestingly that Salem Cigarette uses red, green, and black. 
which if a, pe if a person doesn't really think about it, they will be subliminally suckered into that as being liberation colors. So, hey, we buying freedom cigarettes, liberation cigarettes, you know. And so these are just ways that they grab you. Amazing. Just they know exactly how to do it. Just as that campaign evolved into the 1990s, they brought back the penguin. Now he's a little cooler. He's got shades. And they made it cool nights. A lot of uh, hip hop uh, events. These are full page ads. Uh, then they had the, the um, this was, a, I, I thought, a wonderful juxtaposition on the top of the page. It says, states ineffective in halting teen smoking. And the bottom of the ad was a be cool ad. Uh, the mail order, the, this was the pleasure goods catalog, um, the lotteries, uh, the, the prizes. Now you can enter by uh, going online. And then the natural menthol, the whole notion of natural menthol versus artificial menthol. The R.J. Reynolds company had to get in on the ad. Virginia Slims, of course, has its menthol ads aimed at Latino and black populations in the women's magazines. Now we're coming up to around 2000, where the industry was besieged by lawsuits, and they had to begin to change their image. So they created a series of ads with a, a, talking to the public as if they were being honest. And this you know, the serious health effects of smoking as if you're going to believe anything they've ever said. So these were kind of corporate ads. And this was what they were doing on university campuses uh, when I uh, began, well, it's still going on, but at the University of Alabama uh, at the recruitment. Our interviewing process is very long and very rigorous because we want to make sure that they understand what they're doing. Yeah. Um, we Tonight we'll meet them, tomorrow night we'll have another information session, we go into detail, we'll have a pre-screen, a panel dinner, a panel interview, right. a day in the field, and then an offer. So there's several opportunities for them to meet us, to learn about the industry from different angles, well, to make sure they're smart about what What's the ultimate paradox here? You got people like me who's a physician who fights smoking, well, in a way, if you'd believe the Philip Morris ads, they're fighting smoking, too. Exactly. Well, but you're not saying what the things are about smoking that are really bad. You're saying it causes harm. It, but if, logically, we're all fighting smoking and smoking's going to decline, what's in it for the recruit? What's in it? The future. But, I mean, we, all, we aren't just... Right. I mean, we just spent $300 million on a research and development center that we're creating right now. Right. I mean, our Safe goal... Safe for cigarettes. Well, no, no, no. Our goal is to, to not just be in the tobacco industry 20 years from now, oh. but to come out with other products in the, in the like future. Like the medication kind of, inhalers or things like no, that? No, to be more like a P&G. You know, P&G started with soap, and now they're right. selling potato chips. I mean, that, to eventually come off of um, tobacco products, because oh. we know that, that eventually there will be no future in tobacco products. Well, so that's to good to hear. Are you looking for the best and the brightest to, to, in the retail area now, in the territories? I mean, is that really, obviously, you know, you're not yes. looking for dogs. we, right, we're, what do you mean, for our consumers, or you yeah. mean for recruiting purposes? For, or you're looking to recruit folks that are going to go out there and really be in love with a product and, and, and sell it and say, you know, People have a free choice, and yet I'm... No, I'm no. We are looking for kids. Part of our mission is being responsible, effective, and respected. Mm -hmm. Okay? And what we are doing is we're looking for people that can handle the responsibility mm -hmm. of marketing a product that causes harm. Mm -hmm. And in that means being responsible. It means making sure your accounts know to card everybody that comes through the store. Wouldn't it means making sure that you don't put tobacco products on your counters mm -hmm. so that children, it's at eye level for children. Mm -hmm. Those are the things that we try to do to be responsible. Mm -hmm. What is it in your mind that says, no, this is all right? You know, this is this was the biggest. This is the biggest thing I debated coming into the company. Was my sisters worked for the company for 18 years now, yeah, and recruited me right out of college. And I was like, ah, I don't want to work for a tobacco company. There was absolutely no way I'm working for a tobacco company. But I didn't know a lot about the organization as a whole. And um, you know, once I started to learn, I worked a couple other jobs. And she really worked on me, and she started showing me a lot of um, really their focus, their mission. You know, their values, um, the things they focus on. And what shocked me was that those values lined up with what my values were. And I feel like if I'm going to be a part of an organization that sells a product that harms people, causes all kinds of diseases and, you know, issues with, with people's health, that I want to make sure that company is very responsible about how they do that. But can't um, any company produce a mission statement that, you know, I'm yeah, sure... Yeah, but not every company lives by it. And I assure right. you, I work for this company. Everything I do right. is based off of those things. Every performance appraisal I write for my people, every time I walk in a store and evaluate how my people are handling their accounts and where our product is, every time we do something, it is so ingrained right. in us. I mean. Integrity, trust, respect, passion to succeed, creating um, uh, long-term value, all those things are part of what we do. But if Marlboro sales go down, you're out of a job. Yeah, but 
I mean, realistically, that will take some time. I'm aware of that. Yeah, yeah. real. I mean, and that's what we live in a realistic right. world. Yeah. You know, it's no different than than alcohol. You know, pe adults are allowed to make a choice, mm -hmm. and if they're allowed to make a choice, I want to make sure that I am making, helping them make a responsible choice, Does that it, they know what they're choosing. It's just, it goes on and on and on. I want to make them responsible. They can say anything they want. And they're recruiting college students to sell Marlboros to the least uh, people with the least disposable income. Uh, and and uh, they come on campus. Uh, they, they have partnered with 35 campuses in the United States. I would be at the one where they have been the closest outside of Virginia and North Carolina, University of Alabama. And I actually was thrown out of the recruitment area for trying to observe how they were recruiting college students. It's astounding, and uh, it's the saddest thing in the world. Um, I just want to close with a couple of words about DOC, the group that I started in 1977. We wanted to shift the focus away from uh, lung cancer and heart disease, and we wanted to shift it onto the, the, the Marlboro instead of the disease. And we wanted to shift away from the user and onto the pusher. And so we had a conference. This was one of our super health conferences. Um, and you'd go around Miami at that time and you'd see we're fighting for your life, the American Heart Association. And next door to it, you know, we offer you more because the Heart Association didn't, didn't quite get it. And, and, you know, I think it's important to understand how the cigarette companies have always gotten the last word, even today. Even today, the tobacco companies deny any responsibility in a court of law. When these lawsuits, which are still going on, are argued, they say, well, it may cause lung cancer, but not in that plaintiff, and not in that plaintiff, and not in that group of plaintiffs. So they are lying even today. Um, Taste Country Fresh Salem, we wanted to get up alongside these billboards, and they wouldn't let us. The billboard companies would not sell us space. Uh, so we went to the bus bench company, and we welcomed people to the taste of country fresh arsenic. And you can imagine the first few times people are driving by, what's that new brand? <laughs> and we actually got complaints. You didn't put the warning. Where's the warning? You know, And they thought it was a real brand. Um, we. Um, we were, we were really trying to look at counter-advertising back then. This is 1987. During Black History Month, there's a picture of George Washington Carver, <laughs> the great scientist, in a, in a Salem cigarette ad. That shows you how low they went and for a coupon for $1.50 off. So we went in front of the hospitals and we said, 10-year supply, only 7000 bucks, And that's not including the medical cost. And it's a lot more expensive today. The hospitals were not pleased to see these bus benches, by the way. Uh, they had some of them removed. Um, look at how this, this is Gannett that publishes USA Today. Outdoor advertising reaches ethnic groups better than any other medium aimed at ethnic groups. They're very proud of the fact that they were aiming this garbage to ethnic groups. So we created, instead of the Virginia Slims, the Emphysema Slims. You've coughed up long enough, baby. <laughs> Laughing at these brand names. Benson and Hedges became Benson and Heart Attack or Benson and Stenches. You can make fun of these companies. And I challenge you to use the MSA money to ridicule the companies and get sued. You want them coming after you. You want them because then you know that you're, you're under their skin. You want the public to say, my gosh, why are they going after them? I thought they're supposed to be fighting smoking. Must be something these companies don't like. And the devil can't stand to be mocked. The devil loves it when you call him a devil. Oh, boy, they love it. But when you say evil, big tobacco, they love that. That's, oh, they're a big bully, right? They don't. But when you laugh at them, it suggests that you know they're vulnerable, and they do not like that. So I urge ridicule and parody and humor. More cigarettes, obviously, we opened that up to the kids, and we had a whole moron competition. Uh, so we gave them the brand, and we said, do moron. And we have the most creative moron cigarette ads. This is one of your handouts. This is what we carried around the Ebony Fashion where we order, organized a little demonstration we call the house calls, because we were mostly doctors. Um, here's your moron ad. And we, we gave them the brand, and we, we had, have at it. Let's just do moron cigarettes. So Uptown, this was a brand that was supposed to be aimed at the upscale uh, young blacks. So we created uh, Upchuck. I mean, just anything you can do to make fun of their products. Um, this whole notion of glamour, of sophistication. We had a young lady, you know, looking a whole, whole lot better than that. And sometimes you don't need words. You don't need words, you know, you, you just you want people wondering, what is that, what is she up there for? We want billboards with just beautiful people. You don't need any slogans. How about just a nice young couple? We want people to say, what, what, what is that? What? We want to bother people. We want people to not have to have don't smoke everywhere. Maybe we can be more subtle and have people scratch. What is that? Get people talking about it. Don't hit people over the head with messages. 
Uh, we have a president who has signed in the FDA bill, and I give him all the credit in the world for making this part of his administration. But don't be complacent. That's the message I brought to you today. Um, because this is just a couple of years ago. This is the Intercultural Cancer Council praising Diversity Inc., a magazine uh, that named uh, MD Anderson Cancer Center one of the top 50 places for diversity hiring. Guess which one was number one of Diversity Inc., the top 50 companies for diversity in 2005? Altria, which is Philip Morris. Notice altruistic. They renamed the company to Altria. Innovation comes from diverse people and places. They are still playing the race card. They've been doing it. They will never stop. This is the company that wants to be your friend and will defend it. Uh, the top 50, right there at the very top, is Altria. And a letter from the president of MD Anderson Cancer Institute went out urging people to support the sponsors of Diversity, Inc. So in my mailbox two months ago, this arrives, February 4th, 2011. I'd like to invite you to be there when Barbara Frankel and I unveil the 2011 Diversity, Inc. Top 50 Companies for Diversity, and one of the sponsors is Altria. They were named number eight among hiring in, uh, of African Americans this year. So it's still going on. We don't need to support that. We don't need to be a part of that, just like those US News and World Report ratings of colleges. You had a speaker this morning, Vice Chancellor, that was as good a speaker. And, and Pine Bluff sounds to me like as wonderful a campus, your dean of education inspired me. You don't need to worry about where you rank on things if US News and World Report, which for decades took more cigarette ads than any other news magazine, you need to look at, at, let go of these rankings, and they need to stop this nonsense of appealing to people as a top company. They are, Philip Morris, believe me, is not a top company for African Americans. But it goes further, because the Black Caucus is still getting money from the tobacco industry, and you've got to stop assuming that, that uh, the congressmen and other political leaders are your friends if they're still taking blood money from the tobacco industry. Congressional Black Caucus, and it talks about how the tobacco companies were a leading funder of this particular event. Well, I brought you a message of hope, I hope. Uh, it's something that uh, I'd like you to, you know, I warned you it was going to be a little hazardous to your preconceptions. I just want to close with something that I created at the last national uh, conference on tobacco health. It's called Your Drugstore and Cancer Center. I'm Alan Blum. I'm the chief registered pharmacist here at your drugstore and cancer center at the National Conference on Tobacco or Health. And um, we sell only FDA approved tobacco products, one stop shopping for all your prescription cigarette and chemotherapy needs. We're also opening up a chain of retail clinics within our pharmacies so you can get your cigarettes and other tobacco products and get your health care at the same time. Um, it's really all about money and um, it's, it's big bucks. Um, we have uh, the actual contents of a convenience store that I purchased, and we've just decided to construct the pharmacy entirely of cigarette products and their advertisements. Because, in effect, about 8% of tobacco, 8% uh, of chain drugstore profits are cigarettes, and about 6% of cigarettes of sales are uh, cigarettes in the chain drugstore. So, Walgreens, Rite Aid, CVS, Walmart are still making big bucks off the single most uh, important cause of death and disease. And you know something, that um, there are actually more drugstores that sell cigarettes today in 2009 than sold them in 1980, because that's when the pharmacists were beginning to stop selling cigarettes because of health. But they've been wiped out by the big chain. So I hope you enjoy it. Your business chains will be ready in just a minute. And, uh, and, uh, um, we have our registered pharmacists here, Dr. Cummings and Dr. Vidstrin and Dr. Dunnington. And uh, I'll just take you on a, a little outside tour. It's our buddy from 10 years ago, Joe Camel. Just a variety of your tobacco products. Our landscaping are some of the promotions that we've collected over the years. Now that's not litter, is it? Oh, no. Uh, well, it's up to you. If you'd like some, you can have it. And um, the kids that come to our stores, they get to enjoy the, some of the free tobacco products. Uh, buy one, get one free. And um, after all, we're alive with pleasure. So um, we, uh, have taken an interest in this. Unfortunately, the, uh, we wish the, uh, the chain drugstores would as well. 
and one last wall, we've got uh, the other brand name, which was Wrong Aid.